Greetings, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome friends. So good to see you all. Please do feel free to pop in the chat where you are in the world. Where are you zooming in from? <clears throat> <clears throat> we'll just give it a minute and let more folks find their way in before we begin. We've got Phoenix, Arizona, Syracuse, Connecticut, DC, Mass, Myrtle Beach, Lenox, Blue Ridge Mountains, UK, hey Cambridge, Canada, Saskatchewan, amazing. Isn't it so incredible that we can be connected all around the world? Welcome to the very first session of our exciting series where we are amplifying voices of the global majority. My name is Iset Rose. I am the Director of Creative Strategy for Kapalu, and I'm so excited to be co-hosting this series with my colleague and one of Kapalu's lead faculty, Monique Schubert. This Amplify experience is made possible by the generous support of Kapalu's donor community, and we are so eternally grateful for that support and that we get to do amazing things like this. Hi, Sharonda. Okay, so with the support of our incredible donor community, Kripalu has joined forces with change makers around the globe who work to dismantle inequity and harm, steward the planet, prioritize collective wellness and stress interdependent liberation. Throughout history, Voices of the Global Majority, which is a term we are using at Kripalu um, that speaks to black indigenous people of color who are the majority of people around the world. So versus minority, we're speaking to the power of the global majority. And these voices have been at the forefront of breaking down barriers of systemic issues that affect both the planet and humanity and ushering in radical change, whether that's been bringing yoga to the West or fighting for justice on the front lines. And now at this profound moment, it's really a time that requires us to listen and heal historical wounds and do something different. We enter this work as an act of community care because none of us can be well unless all of us are well. It is with great gratitude and humility that Kripalu acknowledges that we are working, practicing and gathering on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Mohican people who are the indigenous people of this land. And that makes it um, an even greater and more sacred honor that tonight we get to kick off this event with two incredible spiritual leaders of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans. Sean Stevens, who has uh, been a collaborator with Kripalu for a long time, is here. Sean Stevens, Red Eagle, is an enrolled member of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans. He lives among his people who are originally from the Hudson Valley, New York, but now reside in Bowler, Wisconsin. A spiritualist, musician, artist, historian, and share of knowledge, Sean has been fulfilling his path journey for the past few decades by doing a variety of sharing in his people's ancestral lands, as well as the Midwest. Sean describes himself as a helper to not only his people, but to all. He explains that his spiritual path is to share the many things given to him for spiritual direction and purpose. He does not have nor will accept any title such as medicine man or shaman. Sean is also a traditional Native American storyteller, drummer, dancer, singer, and flute player. And you might get to hear some of that. He is an ordained minister of the Universal Church of Light and a certified facilitator of White Bison's Mending Broken Hearts. I'll pass it to Monique to share and introduce Shannon. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Thank you, Easter Rose. And I, I wanted to say welcome again and also just to uh, say it's nice to see so many friends and familiar faces joining us here this evening. And I am so happy to introduce Shannon Shada also called Good Singing Woman. 
Nino Nagamo Ikwe. She walks a path of uniting nature, culture, and community. Founder and director of Full Circle Harmony Ministries, Academy of Holistic and Spiritual Arts. Shannon is a spiritual teacher, mentor, and continuing, continuing education provider, excuse me, for NCB TMB, offering Reiki, aromatherapy, raindrop, yoga, along with other modalities of energy healing and holistic wellness. Shannon's parents are her revered teachers, her mother and father, Beverly Pipe Woman and Larry Many Hats Jacobs, a registered Stockbridge Muncie Mohican, instill deep respect to share the sacred traditional ways of her people and carry forth, forth the indigenous teachings, crafts, and ceremonies. Shannon innately serves her community as a compassionate spiritual leader, ceremony keeper, and mentor of the traditional native ways so that future generations may benefit from the wisdom of her elders. Shannon lovingly guides you inward to discover how you can implement positivity, passion, and purpose into your life. She empowers you with spiritual tools and the powerful feelings of the heart that come from connecting in full, full circle harmony with all living beings. Shannon's primary locations are Soder World Wellness Center in Willowbrook, Illinois, and Bodycraft Wellness at Rock Valley Community College, Rockford, Illinois. Shannon currently lives with her husband and loves homeschooling their daughter in Homer Glen, Illinois. And to really uh, begin this in Kripalu fashion, let's all take a breath together. And even a few more of those, just a easy breath in. And let your breath out with a sigh or a sound, just softening a little bit. And with the next few breaths, just allow yourself to pause. Sacred pause. Letting things slow down a little bit. Arriving in your body. And as we prepare to move into this gathering tonight, it might be interesting to check in with ourselves as we begin, feeling ourselves grounded feet to the earth. Feeling the places where we're supported by a chair, seat or back. Taking a moment just to listen to the space around us, to locate ourselves exactly where we're at in this moment. As you explore sensing the space around you through sound, you might notice what it feels like when you're maybe searching for a sound. And noticing when sound just arises in your attention.
and shift your sense of listening from scanning the space around you for sounds to seeing if you can listen within. Listen to your body. Listen to your breath. Listen to your thoughts. Listen to your heart. And as we take maybe even one step deeper into the space together, I invite you to imagine listening with your heart tonight. And as each of us kind of connects to the energy of the heart in the space of togetherness, we're kind of creating a field of heart energy, maybe. And I would hope that at any point this evening, we can, each of us, and collectively step back into the field of the heart and take refuge there to ease and deepen our understanding. And take in just a few more breaths, noticing what you are going to use from this centering, what you're gonna bring with you forward. Continuing to check in and just notice. Take another breath, let it out with a sigh or a sound. If you feel the urge to stretch or move, please do so. I'm about to pass it over to our presenters and we'll get to hear from them directly. And while they're speaking, you may have inspirations or questions. And we just invite you to drop any of that in the chat at the end of the talk. Isid and myself will uh, moderate the questions uh, for our presenters. Um, so that's just a little bit of housekeeping. And now I will pass the mic over to Shannon. Or did I pass it to the right person? Well, Sean, I'll start. <laughs> Good evening, friends. Thanks so much for joining us all around the globe. This is an awesome opportunity um, to be joining my brother, Sean, here in this presentation. Um, I'll let him lead, actually, uh, take that uh, step forward into our presentation tonight. Oh, I greet all of you. My name is Sean Stevens, uh, also Red Eagle. Um, what a great, what a great place to be in Kripalu, you know, the, the wonderful people he said, Monique, all the people, you know, that I, I couldn't even mention. Um, one of the people I'd like to really throw a name out there is Jennifer Reese, I guess, uh, you could say she discovered me, maybe. <laughs> and uh, with the helps of her and my sister Shannon, 
you know, from years ago where they just kind of lassoed me and drug me off the reservation to share what I have to with a much broader world. And I'm forever grateful, you know, and as uncomfortable as an journey has been, it's been very rewarding meeting so many people, you know, um, we're here to share with you today, not only to answer a call of prophecy, but a vision as well. And we have so much to share that we can't share at all within this little bit of time. I know it seems like it might be a long time, but this is going to be very short, especially for me and Shannon, because we love to talk, you know, and you probably can't see it, but I've got a ton of notes laying all over the place here just to keep me on track so I don't talk too much. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of these visions, many of these visions are, I will say, the, the prophecies have come, and Shannon will be reading some of those to you in a little while. Uh, they have come to be activated, to be activated by a sign. And one of these signs that have come, you know, even within my lifetime, was the birth of the white buffalo calf. And I don't have time to give you the whole teaching of the white buffalo calf woman teachings, but that's something you can Google and look up for yourselves and hopefully you get a good description of it. But this, to give you in a nutshell, the Lakota people long, long, long time ago, they were sent a holy messenger and her name was the white buffalo calf woman. And when she gave the Lakota people their teachings, their sacred teachings, you know, in which they were to practice, in which they were to hold in a holy way, in their way of life to live every day. And this teaching that she had given, she had told them all, practice these things, because there would be a time where a lot of death and a lot of disease, war, greed, and power are going to turn a lot of the indigenous people into a different mindset. You know, this, this greed and power and the war, the sickness, and it's going to become global at the time. And many of the people from falling away, they're going to be subject to this, this, new, this new sickness within the world. And if we all look around at this time, you know, when what's wrong in the world, you see a lot of death and disease. You see, you see so many things that not only are people, people are in a way are, are sick, whether mentally, spiritually, physically, but the earth has become very sick as well. When you look at pollution, you know, from, uh, you know, just, just trash or oil spills. Um, you look at uh, nuclear reactors leaking into the ocean. Um, so many things that are going so wrong with the world and the world is, is acting back on it. Now for the people, they losing, they would lose this foresight, this understanding and being connected, what they're connected in the world. And that's what you see a lot of people these days, you know, they, they kind of see themselves as separate, you know, separated from the earth, separated from everything that, that we are this uh, omnipotent being, you know, the best world, the best of the creator's creation walking on this place instead of walking in harmony with this place. And then with these times, she told them that there would be a sign she would give a sign to when this time is really coming to a head. And that this time was a time for all the knowledge keepers to understand we're in this time that we need to make a shift. We need to start thinking differently, okay? And a lot of these prophecies, these ones that Shannon will be sharing, some of them, these were handed down to us from generations and generations that we must do our part and to help heal the world. And, she had told us what the sign that she would give would be the sign of a white buffalo calf being born. Now, that might just sound kind of, you know, usual, but in all the history, you know, previously, thousands of years of history in, in, a, in, in here in Americas, at least, there was never a white buffalo calf being born, ever, ever. It was just not done. It was very unheard of. And so this prophecy, which kind of drifted off into being considered myth and whatnot, you know, by even a lot of Native Americans, many Native Americans have gone away from their indigenous 
mindsets of their indigenous teachings as well. But this gift that they, she was to give to us is to tell us, now's the time, you're in that time that we need to make that shift. Okay. Now, many people, not only just Native Americans, you know, and if you know a little bit of the history that with uh, our lands being taken, our, our, our languages being taken, our way of life, our culture, everything being taken from us and being conformed into a new way. This isn't something new. This has happened all over the world, throughout Europe, and Africa, and Asia that these, these, what we might call uh, an evil spirit has overtaken the world, taking, robbing people of their true ways, the indigenous ways, and turning them into something that's more conformable, you know, to be under their power and such. And without these indigenous ways, we see what's happening with the earth. But within this gift, this gift that she said that was going to come, this white buffalo cap was to be the sign that happened on August 20th, 1994, in a town called Janesville, Wisconsin. And I'm kind of proud of myself because that's the same place I was born, you know? I was like, hey, that's cool, you know? Uh, but it was a call, call to people, and people from all over the world came, came to view her name. They called her Miracle, the family. And this was our, our warning to say, the time has come. The time is to come get back to your indigenous ways of teaching. The time has come to share your ways, to help others come back to their ancestral indigenous mindset as well. And it was to be, uh, it was to be very diverse. This message wasn't made solely just for Native Americans or not solely just for Lakota Natives because Miracle was born to a non-Native, a white family called the Hyder family. And it's, it's pretty amazing because I know the Hyder family. You know, I went to school with their son and we played sports together and everything. And, you know, so it was something that was meant for the whole world. This wasn't just something tucked away for Native Americans to do in their, on their own time. This was to say, hey, the sign is here, the time is here. We all need to come together. And she had chose that way to chose to be born, to be born into this. And they are one of the best human beings you could ever meet. Some of the most gracious, loving, giving, um, just beautiful, beautiful people. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't think of anybody, you know, more suited that could have been willing to take this gift on. Uh, with the great shift. Now with our Native Americans, I remember, I remember at the time, and it was in the early 90s, it was in my early 20s. And even right here on the reservation, I've seen so many wonderful things happen. I've seen many people who probably didn't even hear of the, the, the prophecy, you know, about um, getting back to their ancestral ways and to their culture and such. We had such a, an explosion of people interested back into their culture again finding a ways of going back to, to our, old, our, our old ways of living, our indigenous teachings that were handed down. is for many, many years, so many of these things taken away from We had so much taken from us, even up into the 1970s, you know, that this, this uh, intergenerational trauma, which still affects my people, really had us going against learning our own ways. But since the night cup, Buffalo Calf was born, I started seeing more, we started seeing more turkeys around the reservation. When I was a child, we had no turkeys. We started seeing lots of eagles flying all over. I mean, when I was a kid, if somebody said they saw an eagle on the reservation, we thought they were lying, you know, because there was none around here. And all of a sudden, we start seeing eagles everywhere. The wolves have come back. We have one of the largest wolf packs in the, in the state of Wisconsin between our reservation and the Menominee Reservation. <laughs> Feedback. Yep, your your sound just got a little um, shorted.
Try unmuting again. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> but so many life, so much life, not only coming back to our people, but also coming back to to the animals that we see, not only you know in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense, the great shift was happening. Okay, you know. Oh, and I was very young at the time, and, and I was still in the beginnings of really maturely reflecting a lot of the teachings that we had had, and a lot of these predict the predictions that were given from so many, so many notable, well-venerated chiefs of the past. And for me, I, I started really looking, digging into my my history to my indigenous ancestors wondering where they came from you know and and it was quite embarrassing for me actually being a native american living on a native american reservation that how little i did know about my people and their way of life you know and so really digging in and learning i just love to be a sponge and, and learn everything that i could and go around and meeting certain people. I met Shannon's father, Lawrence, many hats. And he had lived, moved away from the reservation for many years. And we didn't really have any traditional elders at the time. And this is right around that, around that time, he was back as well. So we were given all these gifts, you know, and, and to, to say that, you know, the, this prophecy you know, it, it wasn't, you know, just, you know, some <clears throat> quatrains or, or some vague prophetic, you know, um, 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 prophecies, you know, that could go with any kind of time or any kind of um, situation. It was simple and very direct and to the point. And when the white buffalo calf comes, the shift is coming. I saw that shift for myself, not only within our people, <clears throat> but within also the life around here. And that gave us, you know, for me personally, it really gave me the energy to say, this is something big. This is something very important. This is something that I must share with other people. And following an indigenous lifestyle. And when I say an indigenous lifestyle, it means the connections, understanding your connections. I don't mean as a certain race understanding your connections and where you come from, okay? And following these, I've had a lot of visions given to me as well. And one of those visions was to, and it's a long dream, I can't explain the whole thing to you, but that I was supposed to share. I was supposed to share with people. And we still, we're still um, on that, you know, cusp of a lot of Native Americans still find it very hard to share and very untrusting to share they don't want to share you know but some of us who have had we have we've got these teachings we've seen the gift we've received the, vi the visions and that we know that we are supposed to share you know because the earth needs it like i said we need to look further on into the next seven generations you know and what i see right now it's not looking good until we shift and we need to start looking more on the indigenous way of thinking like I said, it doesn't mean going back and living in huts and shacks. It's understanding our connection, our connection to this earth. You know, I don't want to go too far because this is another explanation that I'll hold off until you know we let Shannon speak here in a little while. Um, but this this shift and this understanding and what we're being told that we must share this information, that's all coming today. And we have to have patience. I mean, it's been 28 years since the sign has come. And so it took, for many of you who might not have heard of this, it took 28 years for you to even hear of it. You know, but we're all casting seeds here today and hoping that they'll grow. In each generation, things will be able to heal. Things will be able to become better for not only just for us, but for, for our generations down the line. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to pause there and let Shannon go ahead and read some of these prophecies and throw some of her words in there as well. Like I said, I'll talk forever if I don't stay on task here. <laughs> so, go. Hey guys. So, you know, 
Thank you, Sean, for sharing that story. And the white buffalo teaching is very important to me too. So my father was a tribal member, Stockbridge, um, and my mother, Cherokee, Iroquois, as well as Northwestern European, German, Scottish, Irish. And so growing up in a traditional native family, um, I didn't, um, I had I had these wonderful teachings from my parents, but then out in the world, I would I was a traditional woman I'm a traditional woman's dancer, but growing up in high school, I would go dance at these powwows. And I wasn't quite accepted by my native peers because my skin was so light. Um, until they found out who my parents were, because they were very um well known in, in the community as elders. And then they, you know, gave me a little more room, but um, and an acceptance. But then I would be traveling the halls of my school, which is in Chicago here, and I wasn't quite accepted amongst my peers there either, um, because my family, you know, we called our home a lodge, and we lived very, very differently. We had talking circles in our home um, all the time, and we lived a very different lifestyle than the suburban norm um, of of our area. So growing up was hard. I didn't know where I belonged, but luckily I had parents who were traditional um, spiritual people and they reminded me and when they taught me of the medicine wheel, and this is a symbol of all of the circle of life, the wheel of life. And each one of these colors represents um, different nations around the world north, east, south, and west. So we all come together as one in this circle of life and we're all connected. And that's the harmony and the wholeness. And I was um, a sophomore in high school when the white buffalo calf was born. And um, when my parents went, that's when they told me that, that about the white buffalo um, prophecies. And they also introduced the rainbow warrior prophecies, which is what when I heard that of the Rainbow Warrior prophecies, that's when I knew I belonged because I am mixed blood and I don't represent just one section of this direction. I represent many of these directions, as many of us do here. And that belonging um, is, a, is, a, is something we're thirsty for. And um, some of us know our backgrounds, some of us don't. Um, and I found when I heard, when I heard these rainbow warrior prophecies, I knew that I had a purpose and that purpose was to use uh, healing and a, and a strong voice and to unify. And that just because, you know, many people hold just one corner of that circle, but those of us who hold many corners of that circle doesn't make you less than it makes you more because you're holding more than one space. And for me, I needed to hear that growing up at that time. And so I'm really happy to share with you um, this prophecy, which changed my life and gave me the strength and the courage and that sense of belonging. Um, there are handouts that you may um, hopefully had received along this. So I had, uh, Sean and I had put together prophecies of the rainbow warriors and the seventh generation prophecies from all over the globe, whether that be First Nation people, um, whether that be those from Guatemala or Hawaii or those of Mayan um, ancestry. So this was a global thing that uh, prophecy that was being shared and spoke about. I'm just going to read two of these to you. And the first one, which is number one on that handout is there will come a day when people of all races, colors, and creeds will put aside their differences. They will come together in love, joining hands in unification to heal the earth and all her children. They will move over the earth like a whirling rainbow, bringing peace, understanding, and healing everywhere they go. Many cultures thought to be extinct or mythical will resurface. At this time, the great trees that perished will return almost overnight. All living things will flourish, drawing sustenance from the breast of our mother earth. The great spiritual teachers who walked the earth and taught the basics of truth 
of the whirling rainbow prophecy will return and walk among us once more, sharing their power and understanding with all. We will learn how to see and hear in a sacred manner. Men and women will be equals in the way creator intended them to be. All children will be safe anywhere they want to go. Elders will be respected and valued for their contributions to life. Their wisdom will be sought out. The whole human race will be called the people and there will be no more war, sickness or hunger forever. And then the second one I wanna to read to you is number 11 on that handout. And it's, we have the opportunity to build a rainbow bridge into the golden age. But to do this, we must do it together with all colors of the rainbow, with all the peoples, all the beings of the world. We are who live on earth today, are the rainbow warriors who face the challenge of building this bridge. And those things, let them sit with you and know that you belong, we all belong. And when we unite together, it is the teachings of our medicines, of nature, of many cultures. And many of these ancestral or cultural ways we have in common. A lot of the different um, people I work with are of um, yeah, different descent, like Polish. And all of us, many of us have gone through um, ancestral genocide and stripping of our cultures or our language or of our, of our, our, our people. And so what I have found though in these discussions is, as, a, as a student learning from others is that there are many things that we have in common that really unite us. And a lot of those beliefs are through the earth, the energy and the elements. Um, those are things that are long in our history of ancestry and beliefs. Um, and I'm not sure, Sean, if you want me to go into that now, or if you wanted to talk about, um, do you wanna talk about Dr. Emota's messages in water when I go to the water? Well, maybe I'll take over from yeah, there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and as I was saying before, to be indigenous, uh, the word indigenous, it, it basically means like, you know, where you come from, you know, and, and like I like to explain to people, you know, like if we could all sit here and point to where, where our ancestors came from, whether it's north, south, east, or northeast, southwest, whatever, we'd all be pointing in different directions, you know, but if we all hopped on a spaceship and drove a million miles away from the earth and said, okay, where do you come from? We'd all come point at the same place. We all come from this earth. I don't believe that any of us, that we, we own the land at all. We are part of the land. Now, if you look at all of you, all of you, all of us, every race, every human being is related one way or another through our genetics. If you look at every plant, every animal, we all share certain genetics. We share something in common. Even with the fungus that grows out there, everything, everything comes from this tree of life that all sprung from this earth. We are all made of earth. We are earth, okay? Uh, I, I like to think of this uh, a prophet, and I believe it was a Kikuku man, and he had said that he had a dream one night that he went and he sat by the fire of the creator. And the creator had pointed down to earth and he said, you see all these men, these people down there, you know, people who are white, black, red, yellow, all the colors, everyone's down there arguing over which land is theirs. He said, I want you to go down there and I want you to tell them, to remind them that the land belongs to me and that they're not to forget it. And they are all part of the land. And for that, that really resonated with me because we are everything. We are all family, we're all brothers, we're all sisters, not just humans, but plants, animals. And there's a cycle there that we all depend on each other. Not only just with the, with the plants and the animals and the, the fungus, with the, the earth, fire, wind, air, and the water, all of that, okay? And with our, our indigenous ways, we have this understanding and well, at least through, through my people, that 
is that when you look at even modern science, it just goes hand in hand, especially with the quantum physics and such that we, everything is connected. We're going to stop at Earth right there because even Earth is a part of the solar system. It comes from the solar system. The solar system comes from the galaxy. The galaxy comes from the universe. We are connected through everything. Okay, where time and space kind of disappeared. Everything is here. Everything is now. We're all connected, everything, okay? And even just to, to, to come into this power and this understanding and, and to, to give thanks and to have ceremony, it all comes from this energy that we're all connected to, whether you want to call it chi from the earth or whatever, whatever type of this energy that flows throughout the earth, throughout the universe, we are all connected. We are all part of it. There is no dead space in between anything. Everything is filled with energy. We're, the whole universe is a whole ocean of energy. We're all just little creatures that swim within it, and we need that energy. We're all one. Okay, and but these days we like to think of differences that we're we're different from these people, we're different from those people, we're different from the plants, we're different from the animals. No, we're all one. We're all connected. We all need one another. Okay. Um, to start in with. Um, I think, Shen, I think I'll think uh, i wait with Dr. Yamoto's work later on to when we get to ceremony and stuff. But for understanding what is indigenous, you can be indigenous too, but it's the mindset that you have, okay, I'm connected to all these things. And if we have more people who have that understanding that we are connected to the earth, you know, they might think a little bit more twice of dumping out that old oil over there in the, in the woods or over there or dumping, you know, all this waste that's infecting the earth because when we make the earth sick, we're making ourselves sick because we're connected. We're interconnected. There is no separation there. And we have to have that understanding. And that's with a lot of Native Americans and many all, pretty much every other indigenous culture, no matter where you're from, they had that belief system that everything was connected, that there are spirits and spirits or energy, whatever you want to call it, in everything, everywhere you look, it's all around you. Okay. Shannon, you go ahead and make your point. All right. So water. My my mother um would as a would talk about the importance of water. And uh when we would do ceremony, water is a big part of that. When um we look to the water, it reminds us that we are born through water and we go back to the water. Water is the lifeblood of Mother Earth and all living things on this earth, on this planet. And if we think about it, right, there's science behind this concept that we are all one. And how is that? That is through the memory of water. And when Sean, Sean will talk a little more about that, um, but through this memory of water, if we think about it, all the water that has ever been here on this planet, okay, is, is here. It stays within our planet. And so, water holds memory and as it holds that memory and we come through the water, we have that memory within the making of our being. And when we go upon along our path, this water that we are made of is, it reminds us. So when we're learning about culture or learning new things that are of what we call nature or culture or spiritual. It is not anything new. It helps us come into our remembering. And that's why it touches us so deeply is because we are coming into our remembering and we are remembering through the water. Everything that have ever existed on this planet is part of us. And when we go back to the water, we will exist in every living thing that comes after us. So through that water is very sacred. It offers nourishment, purification, connection, life, ancestry. Where energy flows, right? Where your attention goes, energy flows. So I bring my attention to that connectedness, to that belonging, to that remembering. And we can, if we are, if we are lost from our ancestries, um, from our family, we can tap into that through meditation with water or connection of water as we connect with that higher self and that inner self and all living things. 
Water is that sacred. Fire. These are the offerings, the sacrifice, offers vision, comfort, connection, big, in, big emotions, regulating motives and intentions. So really when it comes to fire, I think of fire offers us warmth and shelter, but fire can also burn us and bring suffering. So it's a choice, it's a conscious choice. Which fire do you feed? Do you feed um, the one that, um, it, that will grow negative um, energy or emotions? Or do you feed the one that brings about healing and positivity? Whichever fire you feed is the one which grows. So we must choose carefully how we use the fire. Earth. Sit back and observe how a part of it we are. The cells of plant stu structure, how similar it is to those of humans. So we have, it, it brings us about respect, right? Because we are very familiar with one another. And earth also brings about imperfection. My dad would say we are perfect in our imperfections. Brings about sensuality, senses, boundaries, groundedness, you know, being practical, um, listening and utilizing the medicines of the earth because the earth speaks and so do these medicines. And I like to think of when I was learning, when my father was teaching me about sage, he would just say, sage is about purification, strength, and truth. And I just took those as words until I started diving deep into my own spirituality and my own consciousness as an adult. And I thought, okay, when I, when I started learning meditation, okay, first you have to pure, purify the mind. You know, that's non-attachment to the thoughts, to the experiences. Observe as they flow, but not become attached to it. That's the purification. And then strength, we need strength because in order to come to the truth, it's a hard thing to do. Truth means removing the illusions, right? And that means removing the illusions is understanding the difference between facts and our beliefs, right? Those are two very different things. And often we portray our beliefs as facts when they're not, they're just our beliefs and those are impermanent. So the earth reminds us of impermanence and truth and strength and the importance of purifying. And then lastly, air. These are the transition, liberation, logic thinking, intellectual objectivity, balance, calm, and brother whirlwind, the playful one, right? The sarcastic one. There's, there's a time and place for all of these things. We just, like a whirlwind, like a tornado, you can't feed it too much or it gets out of control. So there's this balance, this two that we have to claim and hold in order to be in harmony with it all. And air, right? I think when I think of air, it's what energy do you blow, which, which energy you choose to blow into, give power to? Um, are we in the present? Or are we in the air of the past? Are we in the air of the future with worry? Can we be in that present moment with our breath? And a lot of those teachings of earth, energy, and elements are, are, are commonality amongst all peoples. And they have different names and different sim symbolism and reason for them. But really, those are all the same things that we, we, we honor and we come into that remembering of, of these sacred ways. And that is just being a sacred, sacred living being on this planet and that oneness. And that's what I have for that area, Sean. It's on up to you. Oh, and when we talk about a uh, spiritual path, like with Native, I mean, sometimes we use that term loosely, but with, with the indigenous mindset, your spiritual path and your life, they're not two different things. Mm -hmm. Your life is your spiritual path. Your spiritual path is your life, everything. It's everything that is around you and, and you come into that understanding. And uh, even with the, the, the speaking of the elements, the earth, fire, air, water, we are, we're all part of those elements. We come from the earth. 
the, the things that we are sustenance that we need grows from the earth. Uh, we're made of, let's say 80% water, okay? Fire, you know, if you feel, you feel yourself, you feel that warmth. Now understand that fire, flames are only a product of fire. You know, the warmth, that life-giving warmth that we all carry with inside, we carry a fire with inside of us as well, okay? The air, the air that we must breathe, we have that it goes into our lungs that puts the oxygen into our red blood cells that feeds this machine that seems to walk around with no roots, no wires and has life. Okay. Uh, so, so in this understanding that we're a part of all of those things and that we also are a part of all of the energy, you know, and we're may, we may speak of energy, you know, in our culture, we might speak of the spirits as well you know, as both are in the same, you know, and for me, science and spiritualism, you know, if you're looking at them in the right way, they're the same thing, okay, no, and the thing is that we, we've lost that connection, that understanding, you know, and just how powerful and that who we are and where we are, when we make our sacred fires and we call upon all the directions of the universe, you call upon all of those energies that everything is connected to have that attention right there. You, you become that, that fire becomes the center of the universe, all the energy and all power, everything that ever was, everything that ever will be. It's very, 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 very important. That's why sometimes we like to make our fires to try to do it in a natural way, especially like with a bow drum, you know, or when we think of a stick or fire, you know, we, we go into our meditation, you know, and we're thinking all positive things and positive thoughts, you know, to come into this sacred fire. And that thought, that thought starts with a little electrical spot, spark within your neurons and your brain. So that's energy. And that energy becomes action throughout our body to create this. And we've got this mindset that we're making this spiritual, good, warm, loving, creative fire. And, so, and that fire that we must feed, we feed it. And we always tell people, when you come to your cer ceremonies, you always have to come with good intentions. Never come with judgmental. You don't, you don't look at everything and say, oh, I don't know about what's going on over here. Look at these people. How are they dressed? So because you bring negativity. And that's what we're not, we don't want within that spiritual path is the negativity. We're trying to overbalance the positive and those things that we have a connection to the whole universe to even bring forth the manifest things within our own lives. And as long as you positively think about these things, okay? And so uh, one of my things is that we need to go out and, and, and I should say one of my thoughts is that we have to go out and reconnect. We have to teach people to go out and reconnect. You know, some people might laugh at tree huggers, but hey, have you ever really hugged a tree and gone away feeling bad? No, of course not. They're a life form, they're a life, thing, and they can, they can give you that energy. They can take the bad energy from you. They can give you positive energy. Our elders had always said, whenever you're feeling bad or you're not sure of things, you know, you need to go by water or you need to go out and by the woods. Get outside, be connected. And it's amazing how it works, okay? And not only how it works and how you also can transfer that energy onto other things. And I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, uh, experiment done by Dr. Emoto. Uh, and if you've ever seen the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? That's exactly what it's called. They talk about this, this experiment. And what happened is this scientist, he had taken these jars of water and he had two different sets of, of several jars. And he would take one set and he would say, all kinds of beautiful, loving things. It's like, I love you. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. Thank you. Everything positive that you could do, everything great that you could say or try to manifest. And he would say these things to the water. And then he would go over to this other group of water in another place. And he would say these terrible things. You know, you're ugly. You're useless. You're fat. You're stupid. You're whatever. You just be real nasty towards that water. Okay. Now, what he would do when he was done after a certain amount of time is he would, they would freeze these water, the water into water crystals on a slide. And 
the one, the water that, you know, he had given all these praises to and stuff, you would, you should look it up. You know, all these beautiful geometrical shapes that was just so amazing to watch, to see what it did to this water. And to the other water, which he had said all these negative things to, the slide came up looking, to me, it looked like, like sewage. It was just disgusting. It was ugly. It was, dis- it was terrible, you know? And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that is amazing. And, and in the movie, you know, the, uh, this man says to, you know, to this woman, to a side the woman, he's like, wow, if that does it to water, what can it do to ourselves? Because we're made of 80% water. You know, and when we got to be, when we go out into the world and we have all this negativity out there, that's why it's important to have things like sage to cleanse, to cleanse this negativity out and to recharge yourself, to give yourself that energy that you need. I apologize. I always say, be kind to that person in the mirror, you know, because we can be the worst, most judgmental, evil person to that person in the mirror more than anybody. And that's where you don't want to go off. You need to keep this positive energy flow coming through. Okay. Now, I thought it was really neat. It was a movie. They said it was, you know, this doctor's work and everything. And I looked it up. Yeah, he really did it. But, you know, about five years ago, I went back to college and I had a biology class. And this young woman, very, very intelligent young woman that I didn't even really think was, you know, spiritual at all. She recreated the experiment. And she got the same exact results. And I was just so happy, you know, nerd in the back of the class. I just, you know, elated, you know, that I knew somebody that actually did it. It's one thing to be told, you know, but to have somebody, you know, that actually went through the experiment and did it, you know, and it was a scientific experiment, you know, that you have this energy and it depends on what you do with this energy and what you can manifest. Okay. Now, if you tell yourself positive things or your friends, your family, your loved ones, you know, good things will come of that positive energy. But when you're negative and you're mean, you know, you can really put yourself or other people through hell, really. You have, you know, words are very powerful. The words come from thoughts. Then thoughts come from them little sparks that you have in your brain that start your, you know, your, your thinking process. And it has a way of affecting the rest of the world and if you you look on facebook you see all this negative you wonder it's no wonder why people are so miserable because they put some of this so much of this negativity out on the world but that's one of our gifts that we've been given was sage cedar sweet grass um these all kinds of things jasmine palo santo all of these gifts that came from the earth you know, I always try to tell people, you know, don't get hung up if this is something that Native Americans use. This is something that came from the earth. We all come from this earth. Those are gifts that were given to all of us. And it works. It works for all of us. You know, some people have a bad experiences when they talk to other Native people. And I say, well, I had a Native person, you know, told me I can't use them stuff. Well, that's a Native American that didn't know their teachings. You know, don't assume every native knows exactly what they're talking about. A lot of us like to think we do, (laughs) you know, but you're going to have a lot of people who are very negative. And if they're what they're sharing is negative, makes you feel negative. It's not the right teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, these gifts, these herbs, these these ways of connecting, connecting into that energy within the earth, within the universe. Those are things all of our ancestors had before whatever it was that came away and robbed us of those things. And these are things that we all need to get back to and understand we have that power, you know, to change the world, we have to start with ourselves first, okay? And we're casting seeds, okay? Casting seeds, sometimes seeds take a long time to grow. Like I said, it was 28 years before many have even heard some of this stuff, you know, but we have time, but to cast those seeds, I think there was a saying, um, of the person who plants a tree, knowing that they'll never live long enough to sit in its shade and eat its fruit, they know what life's all about. That's because we're doing that for the future generations. If we don't do this now, we're not going to make that shift. And the world is going to be a horrible, horrible place for our kids in the future. And that's exactly what we need to do is to make that shift. Tell people we need to get back to that indigenous way of thinking again. You know, and for me, one of those things is, is having that higher power. 
whether you believe in, in God or goddesses or the higher self, um, whatever it is, a lot of Native Americans, they, they don't even really, in their language, they don't even explain, they don't say God or have a, a certain name. Like in our word, our language we call patamawas. And that just means that which hears my prayers. Okay, or the one that listens, that what that is listening, that hears. Um, we also call the great mystery. You know, because no matter how much we think we have an idea of what the creator of everything is, much more than what we can imagine. You know, but understanding that we always have its ear, and we also have a, a way of being able to assist that positive change that we all need for this coming for this big shift to happen, you know? And so you have to go up about this, looking as that we might not see big change in our lifetime, but we're casting those seeds and we have to understand and hope, hopefully that those seeds we've casted, that those people who are caretaking of that seed, they understand that as well, that it's going to take time. But when you look at it in, uh, you know, without time and space, I like what we're saying, is that it can heal, the earth can heal. Everything we've done to it, it can heal itself, but it needs us. We need to live more in a symbiotic relationship with the earth, rather more than like a virus. Because what happens to a body when a virus infects it? It either dies or it expels that virus one way or another. So we've got a choice, you know, do we help or do we keep continuing the way we are? You know, I mean, money, money does not last forever. You know, but this earth that we have here, we need it. We need it to live on. It's a part of us. We are symbiotic to that earth. Okay. And so, Shannon, if you want to add anything towards sure. that, before I go on. So that really hits us on intention and integrity. So what is something that we can do to feel that belonging, that connectedness? Well, connect with these elements. Connect with the intention, that positivity, come into a sacred space, anywhere that feels comfortable. It could be, this is one of my sacred spaces, but I also love just to go into nature and that's a sacred space. It can be anywhere to create that sacred space. And you don't need all these bells and whistles and tools, right? Like, you know, I can come with my shakers and my drums and all those things that you either, you know, get from somebody or you make or you buy it you know those things are things but the things that you can use in your ceremony is making sure that it holds meaning for you so it's like can i use sage can i use tobacco can i use those things um even if you're not a non-native right my answer is yes because like sean said they're everybody's but the main question I would want to ask you is, do you, do you know the meaning behind it? Does it have meaning for you? And what does it mean? Because things only have power when you, when you give it meaning. When I teach in Reiki, it's one of those things that a lot of times, you know, we think about symbolism, right? Does it have meaning what you're doing? Well, let's say we're all driving around and no one knows what a stop sign means. Does it have any power? No, it does not. But if you have meaning behind something, then there's an intention and you can move forward with integrity. So if you're using uh, medicines of the earth or if you're just being the medicine, you are the medicine. You don't need all the bells and whistles, but if they have meaning for you, they can help guide you and they can help teach you as well. So for me, there's that element of ceremony, but you know, you're in a ceremony every day, every day can be a ceremony and you don't have to do anything special. It's your ritual. It's your way of life. It's the way you walk. Are you conscious of all these things? Are you remembering, coming in, taking time to come into your memory? Are you taking time to drop in, to tune in, to connect? Um, and those who have lots of um, you know, gifts that might be empathic and they might feel like it's overwhelming. Well, we can work with that because yes, it can be overwhelming to connect to all of this out here. But remember, it's actually all in here already. You were born with all of that. 
and connected to all of it. So there's no like bubble that's going to necessarily protect you for that. And that bubble is really a separation, right? We need to learn to tune in, connect in a way that is grounded and yet uh, light and, and find that center balance. And when things become too overwhelming, you can come into the home, that home place. And that can be your ceremony is, have I come home to myself today? Or am I living outside of my body? Am I living outside of my needs? Am I living outside of my connection? Am, am I in the present moment? So life is a ceremony and your ritual is how you walk every day. But yes, you can create ceremony. And I think that's a beautiful way to create a sacred time and space to maybe dismiss some of those distractions. And some of us need that. And, and to be able to come into that oneness, that wholeness, that self, and, and, and listen to that still small voice. And no matter what you do, if you're doing it with positivity, like Sean said, if you're doing that with good intention, if you're doing that with meaning, then that is the most powerful ceremony that you can create for yourself, whether it's a moment or whether it's your whole life, that's the masterpiece. And it is perfect with all of its imperfections. Um, what you put into it, right, is, is the meaning. So it can be simple, it can be elaborate, but remember, it's not a production. It's not a presentation. And in these things, um, you know, we, we, there's parts of ceremonies, right? There's offerings. Um, giving back, generosity, our spiritual tools. I'd like to invite Sean to talk more about these spiritual tools, and then he's going to share one of those with you before we end here in just a few moments. Oh, you know, and she speaks of ceremony, and then ceremony is like, well, what is ceremony? You know, for me, I like to think of it as giving recognition, whether it's recognition to your higher power, to, to the spirit, your spirit guides, to, to the all the all encompassing energy throughout everything. You know, and with those things, it comes offering too. But like Shannon said, it, it has to mean something to you. And to give you an example, my people used to do what was called the green corn ceremony in middle summer. And this was time when the corn was growing very strong, it was very plentiful, and it, everything was going great. You know, with corn, and the reason why we grew corn, of course, all summer, is to have a staple of food that would help us survive through the winter. So this meant a lot to my people at that time, okay? These days, we don't do green corn ceremony. For one, for many different reasons. One, you know, um, the old ceremony, exactly how it was done has been long lost and forgotten. And two is that, which is more important, is how relevant is it to us today? that it's not very relevant to us anymore because of course you know well you know actually we can go down the store and buy what we need and such you know um but we don't we don't depend on it as much and it's not such a life-saving uh staple as it used to be you know and so it's hard to really give all this passion and, and gratefulness and thankful to something that is no longer relevant you know, it would be more like a ritualistically recreating what our ancestors did. Okay. And, you know, but we have different ceremonies, things, you know, personal, you have personal pers people and giving ceremonies and giving thanks and celebration for the, these things that are gifted to us, that are relevant to us this day. Okay. Um, many of us, all of us, we all have ancestors who had ceremonies, whether whether maybe it was the first day of spring, maybe it was the first day of summer, equinoxes, uh, something celestial or something within your own tribal membership that are no longer remembered, you know, but the important thing isn't so much is how they did it, it's why they did it. It's why they did it. And how can you take your, your energy within yourself and show your thanks for these things. And one of them is offerings, is giving an offering. With us, we offer tobacco. And tobacco, and it's still offered today, you know, but to, back in the day, tobacco wasn't as easily come by as you run down the store and buy something very cheaply. 
you had to grow it. And you had to put a lot of time, you had to put a lot of energy into this tobacco. And in the end, for the, the main reason tobacco is grown and used is that it is a gift, it's an offering to the spirits. And very end, no matter if we trade it back and forth or we give it to a person to help come and do a talk for us or to perform something for us, that person in the end will be using that tobacco in their way to commune with the spirits as a gift, as an offering. We give it as a gift and offering as to a person, but in the end, that person gifts it to the spirits. Now, when I talk to you about the, the test like Dr. Emoto had did, I'm sure many of you have heard like if you if you talk to your plants, they do so much better, you know? And it's not just because you're taking care of them better, you're giving them that energy. You're giving them that healing, positive, good energy put into it. And that's what we, we do with tobacco and we grow it and we take care of it. We put all this energy into this because we know in the end it's going to give thanks, to give, to pay homage to, you know, to our higher powers that much we, we sacrificed our time sacrifice our, a little bit of our, our energy and such to grow this for so long to in the end that that was be an offering to the spirits. And we also, we give offerings of food, what we call spirit plates, you know, and sometimes we put them in the fire. Sometimes we put them out onto the earth, you know, for, for the spirits as an offering. Now, when we put it out onto the earth, of course, you know, all the little critters come along and they come and have themselves a little buffet you know, which is good, you know, because we feed them little, them little four-legged ones or the, the winged ones, the, the finned ones, the swimmers, and we feed them, you know, well, it, it's kind of funny, you know, but, you know, what happens to food when you eat it? You know, it turns into excrement, and excrement is something that is a fertilizer. Excrement is something that helps the plants grow, and the plants can grow and the plants grow and they feed the other animals and it becomes a cycle. So when we give, when we go and give an offering of food out into the forest, it's not only to say thank you for everything that we have received, but it's an offering there because you're giving life back to the forest. You're giving life to the animals, you're giving life to the plants, you're giving life to everything in that ecological system, you know, that that is good and that we need here on this earth, okay? Now, that is one uh, uh, aspect of offering, of gifting, of giving. Uh, it could be many things. And uh, to me, an, an offering is something that you've sacrificed your time or your energy or something to give towards another. Uh, it, it could be artwork. It, it could be many, 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 many different things. It, it could be, um, like I'll tell people, because some people are uncomfortable using tobacco as an offering. But I said, well, if you grow flowers, if you grow flowers and you give all your positive energy, you give all this loving, caring, positive energy to this plant, just like the water, just like Dr. Yamoto did, you know, you're giving a lot of power to that offering. And when that offering is given, it's not just something tossed in the wind and, and it's, it's gone. No, it comes back to you in this a very very powerful energy okay I, like i said i wish we had i wish we had this should be like a three-day immersion camp really for everything where we can't fit into this and to keep touching on but that is a big power of understanding and our indigenous ways of understanding life understanding that cycle out there and being able to help instead of take away instead of to damage you know, and giving that offering and also that which the earth and the spirit, everything that gives to us, that sustains us, that we can give some back. And having that understanding amplifies that energy with inside of you for healing, you know, and, and, and it's, it's um, I don't know if karmatic is a word, but it brings, it brings it back to you. It brings it back to you. When you find people who are practicing these things you know, they're very positive, very upbeat people, you know, but there's also that flip side too. When you let those negative things go, remember your words are positive. You can, or if you, or your words are powerful, you can put a person or thing, you know, in heaven, or you can put them in hell. And either way, those things do come back to you, 
you know, but when you practice these things, these are things that we call a practice. Sometimes they say it's good to get up every morning, you know, put your tobacco down and give thanks for everything, everything that you have in your life. And if you can't find thanks in, in anything, that problem is only within yourself because there's much to be thankful. There's much to be grateful for. Every day is a ceremony. Every day is a spiritual path. It's not a separate from our regular lives. We're on our journey. You know, our whole life is a spiritual journey, okay? And the giving with the offerings, that helps us. It helps us being giving people. It helps us understand the ripples of that effect of that offering that can give, whether it's the energy we put into these things, the gifts that we put into these things, or just um, just making somebody feel happy. We, we make somebody feel so good, you know? And I love it when we really meditate and, and it's so good to go out and if you if you can't make it out to the woods if you can't make it by a body of water to have a little corner in your home to create a holy space so that you can actually meditate on these things you'd be surprised you are you are such a conductor of energy and a magnet as well that what you put out there does come back okay and this is a teaching of indigenous people all over the world these are things, and I know a lot of our ceremonies will be done different, but like I said, it's not important on how you do things. Like we Native Americans, a lot of us will use a sacred pipe and using the tobacco, but you can re actually create the same type of ceremony in using something different, something that means much to you, something that you put into you know, yours, whether you're putting flower petals of flowers that you grew into the water or into the fire or out on the land or putting them into the wind, you know, that the spirits, the energy, the grand energy of all that is absorbs that. It's not just a ritualistic thing. There is real energy there. And when you start to understand it, you start to believe it and you start to see these things actually come to fruition. They're actually happening. You grow even more stronger and more powerful. And it helps when people will say, they'll see a difference in you. And they'll say, hey, you mind sharing with me a little bit of knowledge and wisdom that makes you whatever it is that you do, you know, because you seem to be something. And that was my thing when I was younger. I, I was looking for answers. I had to go look for answers. I had so many questions. I didn't know where to turn to. I didn't know who to believe. You know, I didn't want to go on a path to where I just had to listen to somebody tell me something and just have to say, okay, that's just the way it is without question. You know, I had to have something tangible and these indigenous mindset of ways is very tangible. I and mean, it might sound like magic and everything, but once you start practicing, you see that these things are real, that the energy that you put in, the energy that comes back. And that's this energy we all need that was indigenous people or so-called indigenous people, well, indigenous people need to share with the rest of the world to bring them back to that mindset, that we're all connected, that we can make a change. We don't have to be on TV, you know, having or have a million followers or whatever. We're casting seeds. We're doing our part. And not only are we making our lives better, but we're making the life better for the next seven generations as well. And so with giving that offering, it's not only just, it's giving, it's giving life back to the earth, okay? The, the, the energy that's within our tobacco or our flower petals or whatever it is you might come up with that you really identify with, that you put a lot of time and energy into, that offering comes back and it helps. It helps exponentially. And I can't explain it enough. Or I, I can't say, oh, I better... Uh, I better turn it back over to Shannon. Here I am talking way too much. <laughs> so. so I'm just going to wrap this up by think, reminding, okay, what is it that we can do? This is the difference between doing versus being, right? So we don't do ceremony. We don't do meditation. We don't do Reiki. We don't do yoga. We practice yoga. We practice ceremony. We practice meditation. It's a practice which means in that practice, we can falter, right? It is not perfect. And that practice of being versus doing is something we can all 
be part of. And with that, um, you know, I think, are we doing um, Q and A? Are we doing, um, are we ready for Q and A? Are you, you have a, a song to share, Sean? Or I don't well, know if we have time. Uh, yeah, let's wrap, let's do our, um, I'm gonna do a song here real quick. Yeah. A real short and this song. is a gift, an offering that Sean's giving, right? He's uh -oh. offering this gift, this Sean, this, this, this gift, this offering um, of energy of his heart. Yes, and it's not only a gift that I can give, but it's a gift that all of us can give. Uh, somebody real smart one time said that where words fail, music speaks. And in our teachings, uh, a lot of these things like the flute, the drum, the shakers, these were all gifts given to us, you know, and help us in our, our I would say our spiritual ways, but our, our life ways. Now you understand that music is a vibration, you know, and music has such a profound effect on all of us. I always try to tell people if you're if you're really sad, don't waste your time listening to sad music because you that's the bath water you soak yourself in. You know, you need to put on some happy music. And when you put on that happy music, it has an effect on you. You know, there's, there's happy music, there's sad music, there's even angry music out there, you know, and it has such a profound effect. But I like to use the flute, especially if I want to do a prayer. And I always tell people, like, I'm going to play this song, and I want us all to imagine, or us all to pray, you know, on what we're looking for, and what we hope for mankind, what we hope for the earth, you know, and just kind of meditate on that. And let this, these musical notes carry that prayer forever. And so we're all praying at the same time. The, the musical instruments, they were all gifts of the spiritual nature to us, you know, and to help. So while I play, I'm going to play for a few minutes, you know, but just if you want to close your eyes, you know, and just imagine, let that energy build up because that energy is helping. It's helping. And when it's going to be put out there, it's going to have a profound effect for everyone. And we're casting seeds here today. Okay. all the animals, all of the elements, all of the universe, or everything. Oh. oh, thank you so much. Have waves of 
really incredible tingling energy happening all over my body after receiving that beautiful gift sean thank you and shannon it's just such a potent casting of energy and generosity of wisdom so thank you so deeply um i can feel and see so much coming through the chat um in reverence and um gratitude for what y'all presence here today and lots of asking for to be with you in person so I, I assured everyone that that would happen very soon and we would get that three-day immersion maybe five-day immersion whatever it needs to be <laughs> um so before we we close here are there any questions that want to be asked of Sean and Shannon if so please do pop them in the chat um, you said I saw a hand pop up. Oh, so yeah, Brad. Uh, it should be unmuted now. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, great. Just, I, I hope this is a, a short answer, but uh, it might not be. Um, I wanted to ask about your experience with Indigenous culture and the attitudes towards land ownership and specifically the type of almost fetishized private land ownership that seemed to permeate through the colonial world and how so much of what we do today seems to be based upon sticking some claim in a piece of land and then even violently defending it against all others almost belligerently. I was wondering if there were ideas or if you could explain how indigenous cultures in your experience treated land generally, and then maybe some thoughts on the rest of my rambling. Right. Um, well, I would say uh, back in the day that it, it wasn't an understanding that any of us owned land. No, there was land that we inhabited. Um, and uh, 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 there was many other tribes who inhabited other lands as well. We, we, there was a boundary, you know, but as far as land ownership, that there was plenty of land for, for us to live on, to, to get our sustenance from and such. Um, and one of the things is, is a lot of, even a lot of Native Americans today get hung up on land ownership as well. But it comes back down to that that prophet, the Kickapoo prophet, who the creator had told them he's looking at all the people, even even natives, you know, all the people of the medicine wheel, all of them. He said they're all arguing over that that's their land, and they got, need to go down there and remind them that it's my land, it's the creator's land, and that they are all from the we're all from the earth, and that's the mindset that still needs to grow a lot. You know, not only in you know non-native cultures, but even that needs to come back to many of the native cultures as well. You know, is that the creator, that which created everything, made this earth, and we are from the earth, and we are all a part of it. Oh, oh thank you. I think I just want to add to that. I think one of the reasons why. Um, from a perspective of Native Indigenous people reclaiming their lands is due to the destruction of it and the misuse of it. And I think that is one of the really empowering things in our world today as to why we are seeking that land back is because it's not being cared for. And we too are searching for our, 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 our home place right? Things that um, there's hurt and there's pain and there's suffering there and um, within, within our culture and communities. And so trying to make right or wrong can feel good, but there are a lot of ways that we can do that. And that is by preserve, you know, preserving the lands and the waters and giving it the, the respect and the nurturing um, in return as it does for us. And I think that's a big power behind the today's world of um, from an indigenous perspective is 
this is my, you know, we want this land back, or we we want to re be, re you know, reclaim these things back. It's because we want to have more of a, a voice and our hands into the earth and helping it heal and come back to its its beautiful natural ways and end the destruction of it. So that that's my two cents on on part of that. If if that helps, Brad. absolutely. You know, and um, you know, when I come out east to the Berkshires and uh, all of Old Mohican land, which is the entire Hudson Valley, um, east into Vermont, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, and I explain to people, you know, the things, and and many people is like, well, you know, it would be nice if we could just you guys could all just have your land back, you know. You know, it's like that would be nice, you know. But you know, when when we look at it in an in indigenous point of view, um, where we're at today is a very good place. As when I look at when I've come back and I and I learned that it's not healthy to eat any fish out of the Hudson River or some of the tributaries that come along, and or that you shouldn't swim in there; it's so polluted. And it really breaks my heart that these life giving entities that are sources, us, the, the rivers, the, the, the lakes, um, uh, so many places out there that have been contaminated that it's making people sick and the animals sick that come and partake through all of these, these resources, you know? And, you know, maybe uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that where we live, we don't have that issue around near us, right close to us, but it, it is in Wisconsin though. But, you know, that you always give, like I said, you're giving that, that credence, the understanding that these life-giving resources that we're, we're harming them or polluting them, you know. And so, you know, when one, you know, we like to, I like to come back and do my presentations for the fact to let people know that we're still here. A lot of people don't think that the Mohicans are alive anymore because of the movie and the book and everything, you know, but it's a fictitious book. For one, we were not here and to share our history, our history of who we were as a people and just the greatness of the land, how it used to be. And it's not like that anymore, you know, and God forbid if anything bad would happen out in that area where people had to live off the land, a lot of the rivers and the you know and some of the lakes ponds are, are contaminated to make people sick you know and so for things like we and shannon are doing here is we're hoping to get people to understand that connection not only the people but these corporations and the greed and the power who just want to dump it in your backyard because you know they don't want it in theirs you know but this whole entire earth is connected you know, and we, we kind of don't want to look at it as like drawing a, it's like drawing a spot on your mother, telling your siblings that that's your spot. You know, nobody else can have that. You know, we all come from our mother, you know, and in hopes, hopefully one day that they do start cleaning up. And I tell people, you know, this is your land. This is where you are now. And you need to make a stand, take a stand that this is to be turned into a more healthier place for you. You should be able to eat the fish out of the river. You should be able to go swimming and not get sick, you know, and, and it's all these things that have been done in the past that we need to rectify now, you know, and so with land, like, now we always tell people, there's, we're not moving back. We're happy where we're at, you know, but we like to come back and we like to let people know that we are still here and we have this, this message to give to people. That we need to take care of it better. Oh. 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 Thank you all so much. Um, we have come to the close of our time together today. Um, Shannon and Sean both put their info in the chat of how you can connect with them and where to find their work. Um, we will be sending out recordings of this evening. So folks who missed the beginning or weren't able to make it live, you will have access to that recording. Thank you all so much for joining us, um, for being here with us to listen and practice. And um, thank you, Sean and Shannon. 
for your presence and offering and wisdom that you share with us. We really can't wait till we can do it in person in, in an immersion. So I look forward to that. And um, we'll be doing another session next Thursday. So we hope you join us for that as well. Um, and let's just all just take another beautiful deep breath in. And release with a sigh, really just allowing all of the goodness of this evening to really integrate deeply into yourselves, feel the waters of you shifting, the fire of you shifting, integrating, receiving, the earth in your bones, the air in your breath, just as Shannon and Sean shared, we are one with the one and the elements. We all continue through the rest of our moments and our evening, um, just changed by this experience and remembering to um, really bring the, the practice of right relationship with all of our relations and to each of our moments. Thank you all so, so much. Just deep gratitude. Have a beautiful blessed night. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Monique. Thank you everyone for being here. Sean and Thank Sh you so much, everyone. Bye.